It's my privilege to be able to be with you in what was dubbed as a participatory keynote agree that, if nothing else, that is an address where you can participate. Please feel free to comment, ask questions, stop, whatever you want to talk about. Because the topic that I picked is one that I've seen present in this conference for a number of years, and that is how do we integrate? How do we integrate teaching, research, consulting, professional experiences, and how we bring that into the classroom. And after thinking about it for a number of weeks, months, I came to the conclusion that this is a very personal topic. It really depends very much on what your particular experiences are, and what you have done, um, at what stage of your life you have done your consulting, at what stage of your life you've done your professional activities. I think all of these things sort of combine to make this what I believe is a, a topic that I can only speak about personally. So what I'll be doing here is conveying you my personal experiences. Please don't um, interpret this as me trying to focus the presentation on me, but actually it is because I can only tell you about what my particular experiences are, and then have you pitch in and perhaps discuss as to how they may transfer to you. Now the topic is a, is a difficult one, and, and in, in a way of trying to show you where I'm coming from, I like to sort of tell you what my tr professional trajectory has been. I um, got a bachelor's in industrial engineering and a master and PhD in operations research from Georgia Tech. Um, the topic itself is one that has a profound impact on how I do things because operations research is considered or is defined as the science of the best. So I'm continually trying to tell people who feel good about what they're doing that whatever they're doing, they can do better. And that is uh, something that, that um, has an impact on what I'm going to say today. Um, after I got my PhD, I had an opportunity to um, take a full-time job with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. I did that for one year. Then I went back to academia for four years. Um, and then I had an opportunity to spend seven years with Burger King Corporation at a point in its, in its development when it was together with McDonald's one of the leading fast food chains, which it still is, but not quite at the same level as it used to be. And then after I left Burger King, I went back into academia, where I've been since, and as was indicated, um, I not only was a professor, but I spent most of my time in academia as an administrator. I was a department chair, I was a dean at two different places, and then I was a provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs um, at East Carolina University. And that, again, is part of an area where I was actually having a full-time job, but not as a professor. So it's professional experience, if you will. Now, the professional experience that I've had full-time, non-academic, started off with the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. It happened um, without any prior planning, um, but somebody asked me if I would like to essentially, my wife is directing me as she does every day. <laughs> I'm blocking, pla where am I not blocking now? Or you do it because management doesn't know how to do them. Okay, so in that sense, you have to do things. If you have to go in a company and you have to reorganize, and you've got to fire a bunch of people, then management much rather blame a consultant than blame themselves. And it's as with um, Taco Bell, if they didn't know how to develop a labor program, well, that's where I came in and helped out providing some insights into that. So consulting is important. The important thing about consulting, however, is that you have no authority. 
You have influence but no authority. You cannot implement anything. The minute you become an implementer, then you're no longer a consultant, then you are in fact a manager. So consulting means you have influence over whoever hired you and through him or her, the rest of the corporation, but you cannot, you cannot implement anything. You don't have that kind of an authority. So that was a whole different kind of experience because you, know, you, didn't, you always wanted to know what it is that was expected of you and then if you came up with things that were not particularly palatable then you had to be very politic in the way that you presented that. Now, when I went to Burger King, that introduced a whole host of things that I had never, never cons considered. And that is that when you are in a corporate context and you have responsibility and you can implement ideas, then when you do the kind of thing that I do, which is, hey, I got an idea on how to do something better, then you immediately come up with resistance because somebody else is responsible for that. And you're telling somebody in your organization that, hey, you aren't doing it as good as you can. Now, I was very naive. I said, hey, if I get a better idea, everybody's going to embrace, embrace me. Well, that's not the case. Anytime I had an idea, boom. You know, I was stepping on somebody's toes because somebody was responsible for doing it. And here I came up and saying, hey, I can do this better than you. Or I have an idea on how to do this better. So that created something that I just published a chapter in the book that I just called Swartz's First Law of improvement, and that's it. And that basically says that any improvement suggestion elicits an equal but opposite reaction from those responsible for making the improvements in the first place. Okay, so, and you know, that, that to me was coming out of academia, that was totally foreign. Wait a minute, you know, if I have a better idea, you're supposed to embrace it, you're supposed to give me a raise, you're supposed to do all sorts. No, no, sir, that doesn't happen. Um, a very, very good example of that is that we invented that double window drive through that you see at McDonald's. Um, everything, all of our tests indicated that that basically improved drive through sales capacity by about 25%, a very significant amount. I went to our officers meeting where we were laying out the foundations of what the future Burger King franchisees had to abide by and we thought that, gee, you know, they need to put a double window drive through there. Well, the reaction was um, fine, except from the senior vice president of operations, who came to me and said, Swart, um, if I operate perfectly, do we need a double window drive through And I said, well, if you operate perfectly, yes, but nobody does. And we have worldwide data to show that. Well, basically he said, well, I'm not going to spend capital monies to make an operational improvement, something completely alien to me because every data that we had indicated that this would be a good thing. Again, a shock to me in terms of what happened. Well, some additional stuff was led to what I refer to as Swartz's second law of improvement and that says any management group will continue to perform as usual unless it is compelled to change by the action of an external force. Well, this reminds me, there is a place close by that's called Bennigan's. And Bennigan's was a big, big part of Pillsbury. It was part of the Burger King Pillsbury restaurant group. And there um, I was asked to see if Bennigan's could adopt some of the things that we were doing. And um, we said, sure, we did a study. We came back and presented that to the Pillsbury Management Group with great accolades. They loved it. They thought it was great. And I thought we were going to be asked to help them to do it. And I didn't hear anything for a week, for two weeks, a month. Finally, I ran across my sponsor at Bennigan's, and I said, gee, what happened? He said, oh, you did a great job. You did such a great job that our management team decided that it was their responsibility to fix it. 
Well, this then directly cites Einstein, who said that essentially a definition of stupidity is to keep doing the same thing and get different results. And that is what we're faced with here. So a whole set of new, new things that I learned in the real world, so to speak, in my professional life that I'd never heard of in academia. And it seemed to me that somewhere along the line, we should, we should perhaps introduce some of that. So those are sort of my experiences. The point is that research has one set of characteristics, the search for the truth. Consulting has another set of characteristics, make people happy. And your professional life basically says, watch the politics because somebody's always there waiting to get you. So any questions at this point? Any comments? OK, so these are then my experiences. And I then also, when I have live experiences, I try to make problems out of them when I see cute things in the literature, I use it. But I, I feel that I want my students to be able to benefit from those kinds of experiences. And the question then is, within what academia is today, how in the world can I do that? So, and again, seeing at, 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 at what I'd experienced, and then seeing how academia is organized, it almost seems like trying to put a square peg in a round hole or a round peg in a square hole. So that then led me to reflecting on how I work in academia and how the real world seemed to work. Well, in a university, gosh, you have a course in calculus, you have a course in statistics, you have a course in public speaking, you have courses that essentially focus on one stovepipe of knowledge, one subject. Gosh, don't we all tell our students, do your own work? Do your own work? Yeah. Um, and done, many of us have a curve that says you have to compete against the rest of your classmates in order to get a good grade because we're only going to give so many A's and so many B's. And so when he came up with this really silly notion that people should perform according to a bell curve. They should perform according to a bell curve unless you intervened and changed that. And that's your job as a teacher, in my opinion. So, um, and of course in academia, we tell people to write formal papers. You have to follow your APA format and they have to be very, very formal, so to speak. Well, what I found in the real world is that, gosh, you never have a project that only deals with one topic. You have to integrate multiple topics. You have to integrate project management with technical know-how, with uh, marketing, with all sorts of other things. And how they integrate is something that we really haven't learned. We learn in academia by a single topic. Teamwork, oh my gosh, how can you have teamwork in an exam? How do we get people to essentially um, make sure that their responsibility is not just doing what they do well, but also those that work with them to, to do well? Um, certainly, um, Collaboration is something that we don't teach very much at all, in my experience. And communication, gosh, in, you know, in my experience with management, nobody reads the paper. Nobody looks at a literature, literature survey. Nobody states hypotheses. They essentially get a one of PowerPoint presentation. And if you last longer than a half hour, top management is liable to walk out, and that's not very good for your career. So the communication that I found takes place, both in consulting and in professional life, is totally different than the way that we communicate in academia. It's much more PowerPoint presentation. You don't have to do all the literature serve or anything else, because 
their feeling is that that's what they're paying me for. So basically, I don't have to demonstrate them that I know what I'm doing. I have to convince them that my recommendation is the right way to go. And then um, another thing that I believe is something that is quite a, a, a inhibitor in terms of how we do things in academia and how we do things in the real world is textbooks are really a hindrance. Um, they are a traditional depository of knowledge um, and they allow anybody that knows how to read and is a subject matter expert to teach. That is why we call it lecturing, reading the book to somebody and we did that back in the 13th century because very few people had books, they were very expensive, so somebody had to read that book to somebody else because they did not have access to it. Well, why in the world, when people know how to read, do we have to essentially read textbooks that require an interpreter? Textbooks are not written for students. They are written so you can buy them and so you can interpret that stuff to your students. Why not write a textbook so your students can understand it to begin with? Um, textbook always focus on disciplinary knowledge because that perpetuates the stovepipe learning that we do. Um, and um, textbooks really don't teach applications. They have a lot of example and you read about it. But um, the whole idea that you always see in the real world of teamwork Collaboration and communication to management is not something that is typically covered in a textbook, but it's a very important aspect of what it is that you have to do. And finally, textbooks are ridiculously expensive, very, very expensive. So where does that take us? Well, if we want to teach people to do then perhaps their educational experience ought to be modeled along what it is that people do. And if you think about a workplace environment, there people, oops, sorry, yeah. am I okay now? Shall I say? In the, in the workplace, you come in with knowledge, you come in with knowledge, in the workplace, you apply it and eventually and you apply it as a group, and eventually you produce a product. So you come in with knowledge, you come into a workplace, you produce a product, and that is um, the short and the long of what takes on in the, in the workplace. Now, what takes, what takes place in a typical university environment? In a typical university environment, you come in, you sit in a large classroom like this, and you get a lot of knowledge of that particular discipline, then when you, have, when you have received that knowledge, then you have to demonstrate that you know it through a test taken by yourself and so on. And once you pass the test, then you go on and repeat that. And you repeat that cycle for however many courses you have in your in your curriculum, and then you get a degree that certifies that you know how to do things. But you don't know how to do things. You have, you have gotten a lot of knowledge, but you haven't necessarily learned how to put all of that together into a functional environment. So the question is, how do we go from that iterative process of academia, course after course, stovepipe and stovepipe of knowledge, and how can we then translate that into something that prepares students to work, to work in a real environment. And basically what I have done in order to focus my experiences into the classroom, into the classroom is that I have essentially adopted a IGL mode of instruction and that essentially means interactive group learning. Okay. So, so I, want, I want my students to essentially learn from each other, work in a team as a group. And the way that I have done that is that I have essentially defined my course as a number of projects. 
Every quiz is a project. Every um, exam is case study is a project. And every um, term project that we have is a project. And students work on these particular um, projects, if you will, as though they were in the working environment doing a project. And the way that that then works is that I want my students to come into the classroom not to acquire knowledge. If they know how to read and they know how to listen, they can acquire knowledge on their own. Okay? And if they need my intervention, I can provide video lectures. I can show them to MOOCs. I can show them to the Khan Academy. I can show them to YouTube. I can essentially tell them what it is that they have to know. I can provide them with what I call Socratic lecture notes that I talked about at this conference a number of years ago that are, is a totally different form of textbook. But the point is that when you come together in the classroom, you have an opportunity to apply your knowledge and learn from your peers. So what we do now is students, when they come to the classroom, they essentially now have to work on the project, which is quiz preparation, exam preparation, or term project preparation. And notice that I say preparation. The quizzes and exams are still individual, but they can to get work together to prepare for them, collaborate in that way. And then they can create the results. If we elaborate on that, then the way that I expect students to acquire knowledge is at home. And I expect you to acquire information. I provide you with lecture notes. I provide you with a video lecture. So that, and that is exactly what I would do in a class if they were to go to class. But why make you sit there, listen to me talk, when you're a lot more comfortable at home, like this person is, and reading this stuff at your convenience. Now, once we have that, students acquire knowledge. When they acquire knowledge, then they start working together. And the levels of working together is if you, you bring your knowledge, you work on your project, and if you get to a point where you can demonstrate your product, which is doing a quiz, then students will do it. If you can't do it on your own, if you can't learn from each other, then I'll be glad to work with groups and provide them with what I refer to as coaching. Coaching is working with a group. And, and if I still have some obtuse individuals on their own and they can't get it from the teammates and they can't get it when I coach their group, then I will work with them as individuals and in consulting. So essentially, I put my efforts to those individuals that have the greatest needs for it, those that have not been able to learn it on their own, they haven't been able to learn it from their classmates, they haven't been learned, they have they have been able to learn it from listening to me consulting with their group. And then I work with them individually. And when this happens, then eventually the least common denominator can take the quiz as well as anybody else, and that is their work product as though they were working on a project in a real environment. So that's sort of how the class goes. It simulates the work environment. The projects, quizzes, case studies are all drawn from my experiences that I have. And that provides them the basis where students can do interactive group learning for which all sorts of data exist that students learn a lot better that way than individually. So that's what I do. That's how I have tried to integrate my knowledge. And there has been very little interaction. So yeah, the, I did not one morning wake up and come up with this. This was something that evolved over time with a lot of, I have taken all the performance data from students before I switched to this mode and after. You have model? I have comparisons. Uh, you have 
Yes, the letter, the letter grade difference, and I have the numerical numbers too, it's basically one letter grade difference. Okay, better, better for the, so there's about one letter grade difference between the IGL group and what would happen before IGL. But if you have recourse to your classmates, if you have recourse to your instructor, if you have recourse um, to consulting, then there's no excuse for not doing better. Not everybody does better, but the, the average standard deviation. There, there, there is literature that indicates that this cognitive way of learning, and I'm thinking of one in particular was applied in the Caribbean, one of the British islands. And, and students were simply not used to doing that. They were much more used to the traditional way where the professor knows everything, the respect for the professor, and the essentially um, um, hesitation of working with others because they were never allowed to, to, to work with groups. So there are cultural impacts um, that, that have, that have um, done this. Interestingly enough, some of the areas where there was the most rigid structure was in the Middle East. However, now Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar have all committed to going to this kind of educational system. And the reason is quite simple. They have decided that oil does not last forever. They must have an alternate economic basis, and they all want to become what is called a knowledge economy. Okay, they all want to be like the Silicon Valley and, and places like that. And in order to do that, you have to assimilate a lot of new knowledge. I think the new knowledge generated this year alone exceeds the cumulative knowledge of the past 5,000 years. It's an exponential, an exponential increase in knowledge that is occurring. And the, the traditional model of an instructor having to learn that new stuff, turn around and then be able to teach it, simply can't be done physically because of the rate at which new knowledge is being generated. So now an instructor being able to assimilate new knowledge, in particular in the sciences and engineering, is, is, it's impossible, okay? You have to help your students learn. You can't learn it, turn around, and then teach it effectively, and then again next year, learn it and teach it. It's in this kind of an exponential time for, for most of the project came, were inspired by my experiences. But the, by being inspired, it means that I could not bring all of the stuff in, but I had to take pieces and for example, um, I use store location you know, for Burger King as an example. And we start with a simple and then the next quiz more and more and more and over three weeks we built to a very comprehensive case. Sometimes when I go to doctor's offices I get very, very irritated because you have to wait and you have to wait and you have to wait and I know one time we went to an imaging facility, our appointment was at four o'clock, at seven o'clock we were still sitting there. So I said, gee, there's got to be a better way of scheduling. And that prompted me to use that as an example for students to learn about simulation and being able to use a model for different ways of scheduling patients. So another morning I went to try to buy a newspaper um, at the local drugstore. The machine was out. I went somewhere else, the machine was out. Finally went somewhere and there I finally got a newspaper. Well, that, again, made me very unhappy. So I sat down and I made a nice little problem in terms of what is the best number of newspapers to put in these newspaper machines so that you can balance the cost of running out versus the cost of having old newspapers left over, so to speak. So again, my examples come from what I see, what I hear, but a lot of it is, is inspired inspired and simplified from the experiences that I have. 
Um, best grip size make a, you know, typically we find is about five, four, five, six in that, in that range, okay? Um, but more importantly than that is that I, and perhaps you, make the assumptions that students know how to work together. They have no idea on how to effectively work together as teams. You know, we love to give, I think in business schools, 80% of faculty, if not 90, give group projects. 80% of them are happy with the results. 50% of the students are. So students, and why? Because they run into all of these problems. Somebody doesn't want to work. Somebody is um, taking credit for somebody else's work. Yeah, just, just, just the problem. So after I realized that, I now put two weeks of teaming concepts at the front of all my courses. It takes me two weeks, which people say, oh, how can you sacrifice two weeks? Well, I get it back in efficiencies and in performance. So I basically provide um, two weeks during which, and this is for an online course um, for my face-to-face -face courses, it goes faster. But, you know, I'm in a business school. In industry, you don't have a choice as to who you work with. Well, the individual may not have a choice, but I, as a manager, have a great choice, and my, I want a successful project. So I spend a lot of time talking with other people to try to select the best members to be part of a project team. Okay, and sometimes we go as far as getting personality types, indicators, and locus of control indicators. All my students in the class do take a personality type test and a locus of control test. The locus of control, for those of you who may not be familiar with the topic, locus of control essentially on one extreme says that you have no control over your destiny. Things just happen to you, it's not your fault. On the other end, it says, I'm the master of my own fate. I can make things happen. And everybody's somewhere in between those extremes, okay? And it indicates something about their personality. But I make them take that, and in addition, I make them provide additional information that then helps them to put a team together. And finally, the end part of all of this is at the end of two weeks, they have to come up with essentially a contract, indicating in measurable terms what their individual and group goals are for the course. Of course, everybody says A, until they realize after the first exam that they are now being held accountable for those particular goals that they themselves have set. So again, there is a contract that says how they are going to work together and what their measurable goals are. And once they have that, then I turn them loose and they get subject matter. So we concurrently develop subject matter knowledge and teaming skills. So during the entire course, students work on these projects, they sharpen their teaming skills, and by sharpening their teaming skills, they're learning the subject matter better. So it's a concurrent learning of two different subjects. Well, first, you know, most of my teaching is online. Okay, so the students don't know each other. And that takes care of one of those issues. Um, typically, what I do is I allow people that know that they want to work together to work together. But also, I have just enough groups with just enough people, so everybody has to be allocated somewhere. So if you have three people that want to work, that want to work together, that leaves two vacancies which are then available to some of the students that you're talking about. Um, Just, I'm what sorry. Do you find that there, there, is, there becomes quite an imbalance between groups in that situation? Uh, well, wh what, I, what I found is that when that happens and when there's a group goal to be met, <coughs> the good students take much more responsibility for the not so good students to learn mm. because it reflects in their goal performance. So there's a greater motivation for collaboration and help between students um, in those cases. Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
Well, I find that students, when faced with an impossible task and consequences for not accomplishing them, can accomplish wonderful things. In other words, if, and you know, what, what I do is my exams, for example, are very complex. They are almost impossible to solve as an individual. So by having these impossible things, students come together and collaborate and innovate and come up with different ways of working on those issues. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It is, it is. Uh, yeah. yeah, integrate yeah. many courses, yes. multidisciplinary, sure. work on yeah, yeah. So I, IGL, PBL, all of those things are the same, same gender of things. Yeah, I do um, peer evaluations, um, but I do them perhaps a little bit differently because my students have to write a contract as to how they're going to work together, what is tolerable behavior, what is not, and what their goals are. And my peer evaluation is very simple. And that is, does this member, did this, did this member abide by the terms of the contract? And I do a midterm peer evaluation that I share with students that it doesn't really have teeth. But at the end, students can flunk the course if their team members do not, do not rate them as having adhered to the terms of the contract. And, and that is a big thing at East Carolina University. Um, for the kind of courses that I teach, and let me just make a comment, All my teaching is at the MBA, Master of Business Administration level. Um, and most of my, and I have two classes every semester that are online, about 70, 80 students. And one class on campus that usually has about 16 people for whatever reason. Um, the internships, of course, are much easier to implement with a face-to-face -face environment than when you have the online um, environment and I don't know how they did it but if they were successful. Most of my MBA students are fully employed responsible positions all over the place. So, no, no, it need, no, it needs experience. Um, you know, the, the question is if you deal with teacher education, okay, then do these methodologies work? And, and the answer is yes, as a matter of fact, a lot of this interactive group learning is also called flip learning, if you will, to succeed as individuals. And you can't have people then hide and take um, and not do their work and essentially get credit for what other people are doing. Yeah, and, and that's precisely why I give individual quizzes to prevent that. Because if they see that, gosh, I didn't work and I got an F, not only are they unhappy, but their teammates are also unhappy. It's going to, and there's a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of pressure from team members when people don't come to class or are not prepared in class. That happens once or twice, but then there's a talk between those students that typically makes sure it doesn't happen again. There's a lot of peer pressure here, a lot of peer pressure. Well, I, w uh, well, I wish I could have been as eloquent in saying that as you have. Um, the, what you also are saying is that one very important aspect of group composition is group diversity. If you've got a bunch of people that are identical, which they tend to be when they select their own groups, then they're not going to be as innovative. Whereas if you have a diverse group of people, then you will get a lot more of that innovation because, oh, I hadn't thought of that from a different point of view. So, so that group identity, or sorry, the group composition or the, the diversity of the group, I think is a very important construct in that. Thank you, thank you.
Well, thank you very much. I've enjoyed chatting with you, and thanks for putting up with me. Thank you.